This is track B, Friday, 1600 to 1650. Um, with me here um, is Michael Wiley with How Hollywood Got Hacked. Michael Wiley is Director of Cybersecurity Services at Richie May Technology Solutions. Michael is responsible for delivering information assurance by means of vulnerability assessments, cloud security, penetration tests, risk management, and training. Thank you very much. And now I don't need to do my own intro. Uh, thank you all for coming. I know it's uh, 4 o'clock on a uh, Friday here, so I appreciate you all being here. A uh, little bit of background on me. I had a boutique cybersecurity firm in Los Angeles. Uh, last year, it got acquired by Richie May, uh, which I now work there along with most of my team. I uh, used to spend a lot of time getting different certs and, and doing a lot of uh, research. Now I spend a lot more time um, working on, on client, uh, client services. Um, I head up our Los Angeles office and doing um, content security. And in doing that, I deal with a lot of uh, movie studios, post-production houses, audio houses, um, all over Burbank, Hollywood, Los Angeles in general. Um, the firm started out about 30, 35 years ago doing tax and audit, which I found unusual when we started talking about a acquisition. Um, but they really started moving into advisory services, doing um, business advisory, acquisition help, mergers and acquisitions, and then they built up their cyber practice in 2017. So I was interested in what they were doing. They were very niche focused, uh, traditionally in uh, financial, more specifically in the uh, lending. And um, I did a lot in, I got my, my security background started in the financial sector, so I thought that was interesting that we aligned. And I was focused in the media entertainment industry, which they were interested in, so it just kind of worked out. And uh, it's been happily ever after since then. Um, so basically what I do in my day job is I work with, this is gonna fall. Um, in my day job is I work with a lot of different, as like I said, studios and post-production houses working on uh, their content security strategy. And for those of you who aren't familiar with content security, essentially cybersecurity, but mostly focused around the assets from uh, the content owners. So for example, Marvel, and they're working on the next uh, big movie. They spend a lot of money, time, and energy on that, that content, that asset, and they outsource a lot of work. So they might have a drone pilot or someone doing mastering on the audio, and they don't really want that to be leaked out. And we'll go over a couple of those where that didn't work out so well, and then what the industry has done to kind of shift and adjust in the new mindset around security. Um, so just looking a little bit about the 2019 Verizon DBIR report. Um, I, I love this report every year. It comes out with great information. The interesting trend that I saw this year was that um, the financial sector was a lot lower than I expected. Public sector was pretty high. Over 50% of the breaches that uh, Verizon handled were in the private or the public sector. And then really entertainment was, if you exclude the unknowns um, on the list, they were number two as far as industry-wide breaches that uh, Verizon responded to. Um, there are a lot more than these, but I felt like this was a good timeline, and especially the first couple that we focus on really shows the impact of, of what loose security has in the media entertainment industry. So we probably all remember the big Sony hack in 2014, um, and that's one that has the most data available on the internet. What's interesting about the different incidents that I'll be talking about a little bit is that there's contradicting information all over the place. You've got the studio saying one thing, you have uh, the attacker alleging other things on Twitter, and then you have incident responders or people that are actually looking at some of the data that's being leaked on Pirate Bay or uploaded to certain places like uh, Pastebin, and they're all contradicting information. So I try and gather as much as I can, and, and based off of what I know from certain um, people, obviously I can't disclose uh, confidential stuff, but things that have been posted that I find pretty accurate, I try and grab some of that, and I'll talk to you about some of those incidents. Um, so in 2014, it was, uh, Sony had some incidents in the past with PlayStation and uh, other films, but really the, um, the Sony incident in 2014 was a big milestone. And uh, allegedly, North Korea stole a huge amount of data and information from Sony's networks. We'll go into a lot more of that. In 2016, um, a vendor was targeted. So rather than it being an actual studio, one of the vendors that was working on some of the content, specifically audio for Netflix, ended up having 10 to 13-ish episodes stolen and held for ransom. In 2017, uh, Disney, uh, they, hackers alleged that they stole the Pirates of the Caribbean 
and they were holding it for ransom. Disney still to this day denies it. So depending on who you believe on that one. Um, line 204 was a, a, a basically an audio location or post-production house that dealt with a lot of celebrities. In 2017, they announced and confirmed that they had been hacked as well. Um, what's interesting about that one is there's ties back to the 2016 Larson Studios attacks as well. And then in 2018, there was a merge of the MPAA and CDSA came together to form the TPN, Trusted Partner Network, and we'll talk a little bit about that towards the end. So a little bit about the industry of Hollywood in general. It's an industry with a ton of money. Um, major studios lost $6.1 billion in 2005 uh, to piracy, according to Wired. Studios are pushing for security, intensive security. Some of the workflows that we see are being demanded by some of the studios is equivalent to military-grade networks. They want full air gaps. All USB ports and input-output devices are disabled. Um, the only other place I've seen that is being at some military or DOD facilities. Yet you have these artists that are demanding the freedom, creative freedom. They want to work on their content. They want to come and go. They need inspiration. And being locked in a basically a isolated room without internet, without phones, without anything, it's not going to work for them. Um, this is the hardest thing that I had working in this industry was I came from financial where it's mandated. You have to do X, Y, Z. No questions asked. Security's first. We don't want fraud or money being leaked out. And then the studios were demanding similar type of security controls, but then you had um, the, the chief operating officer or the manager of a studio or a post-production house would come in and say, so Disney, Marvel, Netflix, whoever I'm working with, they really want this air gap network, but if my IT guy's on vacation, I need to basically have it un-air gapped and do whatever I want. Or if the mandate is for USBs to be disabled, I need a way to turn them back on in case I want to plug something in. All these things that, that were these security controls to prevent these things from being leaked, from data being leaked, they basically wanted a way to bypass that if it was inconvenient for them. Um, they would also say, we get it, we have to have all these things, but when this big time producer comes into my facility and demands that he's not gonna follow any of this, we need to basically let him do whatever he wants and bypass all our security as well. Um, if we look at some of the data from um, uh, conversations from the LA FBI's field office, they have said they are unable to investigate all these different attacks, specifically in the, uh, the entertainment industry. Um, all of the public known Hollywood extortion and ransom cases were less than $80,000, which is a little bit interesting, but it doesn't exactly line up with some data I found from uh, law enforcement in California where they said the U.S. attorney generally or allegedly doesn't prosecute if it's less than 50,000, so you'd think that would be a little bit less than that, which makes me think that some of these attacks are coming outside the U.S. If we look at some of the data from the big blockbuster Hollywood movies, uh, we see the top 10 here. We can see that the production budget for, for example, Avatar was almost a, a half a billion dollars there. We can see that Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, $400 million. And we can see some of that domestic gross product or even the worldwide product of, of those movies, you're talking about next to a billion or even over a billion in some cases. So as you can see, these studios that are working really hard and spending half a, half a billion dollars on production and they could possibly see up to $3 billion on the next big blockbuster, they're kind of concerned about some of the, the assets they're providing to especially, let's say, a, a five-man shop that's doing really good audio post-production or a drone pilot. We've worked with one uh, person. It was a single-man uh, facility, and he basically took those DJI drones, slapped on a red 8K camera, and flew it, and he was able to save the studios uh, essentially like a million dollars because they didn't have to set up all these tracks and cranes and all this other stuff. He just flew his drone with the red camera on it and was able to capture the footage for a fraction of the cost. And, but doing that, they're concerned that he now has that footage on his drone or someone might be intercepting the signal. And so obviously they're concerned about that, but it's a constant struggle between we need creative freedom, I need to fly my drone, and the studio saying, well, your drone has to be in a Faraday cage. Obviously, that doesn't make sense. So it's a, a give and push and pull, and it's, it's a difficult industry, but it's, it's really interesting, and there's a lot of security, way more than I first thought when I got into this industry. Um, I tried to look at some of the, the data that supports or is against piracy and how it impacts the box offices. While there is some contradicting information, I found that a one piece or one journal article from Cambridge, it's called an empirical analysis of the impact of pre-release movie piracy on the box office revenues. 
Um, you can look at that in Google Scholar, and it listed a whole bunch of other sources that talked about the correlation between piracy and uh, revenue for, for different media entertainment companies. So for example, they looked at um, mega uploads, if you remember that site, and they tried to correlate that and associate that with revenues of the top three um, studios. And they found out that there was an increase in revenue of 6.5 to 8.5% once those sites were shut down. There was other studies done that there was a loss of about $40 million in revenue due to piracy and, and box offices. In Germany, I tried to grab something else, not just from the US, but in Germany, they found that it was about 300 million losses due to piracy. And so, while in the past, they might have not been a target, now Hollywood is definitely a target. In 2017, we saw a huge spike in that. Uh, well, the 2014 Sony hack was a big deal, and there was a lot of stuff that went on with that, which comes up next. The interesting thing is that in about 2017, we really started to see it being targeted, the industry. And so we could see vendors like Larson Studios. It did happen at the end, end, end of 2016, so I'm going to bump it into 2017. Um, Disney possibly got hacked in 2017. Sundance Film Festival, their box offices were shut down and they lost revenue there as well. Um, and then other media entertainment hacks I pulled from the California data breach that I didn't even know about before this talk that wasn't publicized in any um, vanity or other media outlets was uh, Another Planet Entertainment, TV shows on DVD, Playdom Forms, which I believe is a Disney subsidiary. These were all within California's uh, data breach database, which is required if you have more than 500 leaked records. None of those made the news. So if we look into the Sony one, and this one has the most data, uh, could you imagine coming to the office one morning and almost every computer in your environment has this up on the screen? It says, warning, you've already been warned, and this is just the beginning. It goes on to give them a deadline and a bunch of different links as far as there was leaked data that they had. Um, 3,262 of almost 7,000 computers owned by Sony had this message when they came into the office. Uh, about half of their servers had the similar thing that were taken over. Um, the FBI declared that it was one of the largest cyber attacks ever in the US at the time. Obviously now we have Capital One possibly, Marriott, a bunch of other stuff that's come since then. But at the time this was really substantial and it was interesting that it was the entertainment industry rather than financial. So what we saw about that was that banner that was on everyone's screen. It was a hacking group called Guardians of Peace. So obviously it could be one person or a group of people we don't really know. Um, a substantial amount of the, the systems within Sony were compromised with this. The Guardians of Peace uh, was within the Sony networks, depending on which source you look at. It was about six weeks up to almost a year uh, that they were looking around, doing things. It was undetected. If you think about it as the smaller amount of time, let's say a couple of weeks, the amount of data that they stole in a couple of weeks is really interesting. We, we see different claims of 10 to 13 terabytes of data. There are sources that have found some of those leaks up to about 10 terabytes. The attackers are claiming they have 13 terabytes, which I don't think we ever saw posted anywhere. Um, there was the first doxing when the Guardians of Peace basically published this information. There was 25 one gig files uploaded to a sharing site. And it's believed that it was actually one of Sony's servers that did the uploading to the torrent site. So they didn't catch the exfiltration of 10 terabytes of data leaving one of their servers. Um, Sony reported that there was about 10, or sorry, $15 million in losses from the attack. Um, I've done talks on data breach statistics and how we can't really trust this, so you can take that with a grain of salt. We don't know if that was to replace their CISO, if that was to have a private jet for their CISO to go meet with Mandiant. We don't really know what was included in that, <laughs> but they claim that, and I, I'm pretty sure they probably filed a claim for 15 million. Whether it was actual or they bought all new computers, what that went to, we don't really know. Um, once the, the first doxing went out, then the attackers made a threat that they were going to release pre-theatrical content, which is probably one of the bigger concerns of Sony. Um, there was, once they ended up actually posting that on sharing websites, there was over 100,000 downloads within just a day or two. The results of, um, uh, resulted in postponed movie releases, uh, leaked personnel or personal information of employees was leaked on WikiLeaks, including a lot of emails from executives, which um, a bunch of stuff they probably should not have said about Hollywood celebrities, and that was posted. Um, 
I tried to find a lot of inf or information from FireEye and Mandiant because they were allegedly the ones that, that did a lot of the um, post-incident analysis, but there wasn't a whole lot of stuff. There was a, a letter that was sent out to employees that got leaked, but typically Mandiant does a great job discussing a lot of their analysis. And in this case, I couldn't really find much besides that letter to the CEO. Um, in that letter, there was the assumption, and we can also correlate that with the FBI's flash notice that they posted shortly after, that it was assumed that there was malware involved. Um, some sources says it was unique, but a lot of other sources say that the malware is probably somewhat generic, but it had mechanisms built in to evade antivirus. Uh, former Sony employees ended up filing a class action lawsuit for the ignored security risks. There was alleged um, notices to executives that there was issues that they needed to fix and they didn't do that. And then obviously, if you were an employee of Sony, you'd feel kind of bad too if all your personal information was out there on the internet as well. Um, it ended up causing the uh, theaters to cancel the premiere because then also the attackers said they were going to do 9-11 type of attacks on the theaters. They said if you live near a theater, you should leave your home. Um, Sony ended up uh, releasing the interview, but it was only to about 330 theaters, and they ended up also doing on-demand, so you could stream it from home rather than actually going to the theater if you were scared. Um, the FBI eventually investigated and linked it to North Korea. North Korea still says it wasn't them, so again, it's he said, she said. Uh, the second doxing happened later on. So <clears throat> a while later, and there's a whole timeline on the internet you can go find, but the second doxing happened, there was a bonus.rar and a list.rar. The one that was really interesting is that, that bonus file. There was full of security certificate information, internal, external account credentials, authentication credentials. Um, they leaked basically their YouTube credentials for a bunch of movies, their UPS accounts, their, their American Express accounts. Inside the bonus.rar, um, before it was taken down on one of the file sharing sites, someone was able to capture an image of that. And in there, it's hard to see on the screen, but almost all of these were just password files. There was Kareen's password, login and password, logins and passwords, master application list, master intern password list, master inventory. I mean, it just goes on and on and on of these Excel files with passwords. Um, a security researcher ended up doing the dirty work for me and they counted all the passwords within this. So the bonus.rar contents was about 33.7 megs and it contained over 500 plain text credentials, list of security certificates for servers, usernames, services, credentials again for more things like Sony Pictures, Spider-Man movie, Evil Dead movie, Grown Ups the movie, it goes on and on and on. There was 121 FTP credentials, which I find interesting because they're talking about having content security and their vendors need to be secure and do all these things. And then there was 121 FTP accounts that were in that, uh, within Sony's environment. Um, and then a lot of their passwords for critical servers, like their primary FTP server was Sony12345, all lowercase. Um, we also saw American Express information, accounts, budgets, stuff like that. Um, this bonus.rar was probably the biggest one. It had the most uh, critical information in it. List.rar, this was a 1.8 meg file or compressed directory. And within that, they basically had, this is their reconnaissance enumeration. So you got to see a whole list of what they found on the network, IP addresses, usernames, services being run. So it was an entire map of the internal Sony networks. I was curious about this and I've done this for a couple other breaches to figure out, well, what did that actually do? So we saw that they had a limited release of the movie. We saw that it potentially cost them millions of dollars in box offices. It cost them $15 million in security upgrades after the fact. But what about their stock price? Um, right after the incident happened, we didn't actually see much of a dip. It kind of flatlines there. Later on when more information, that's probably around the time that the bonuses and the list.rar uh, file came out and there was stuff about the executives and what they were saying about celebrities. I think that's towards the end when it tails off and it drops about 20% or so. Um, but we often see with these breaches that within about six months or so after a breach, the stock prices actually returns back to normal or they go even higher than they were before. So, I, don't, I didn't look past that piece, but we can definitely see a dip right after the incident, and presumably it went back up after that. Um, let's look at the Larson Studio hack. So this one I find particularly interesting. They're in my backyard, and they didn't go after a big studio. They weren't going after these, these big fishes, but they were actually going after one of the vendors. And we often see that um, vendors 
are the ones that you need to look out for, right? If you're focused on security, you're doing all the best practices, but you outsource it to someone who really doesn't care as much, that's kind of a weak link for you. I always think humans are a weak link, but vendors are definitely a weak link. Um, and I think there's someone talking about vendor reviews tomorrow. You should probably check out that talk. Um, so Larson Studios, they were a mom and pop family run um, audio post-production house in Hollywood Burbank area. And what was interesting about them is that they had the, they were working on the Orange is the New Black along with a lot of other stuff. And that's what got leaked. Um, so the Dark Overlord was the one, the group or the person that did the hacking and the leaking. Um, they were very active, kind of letting people know it was going to come out, that they were going to post things on Pirate Bay. Um, their pastebin account, I don't expect you to read this part, but it, they send a letter to the Larsons, who owned the Larson studio, and they talked about um, some of the ransom and what they were going to do. And then eventually, I believe it was on Christmas Day or the night before that the Larsons found out that this was legitimate and it wasn't just a bunch of um, hoax. And the Dark Overlord kept telling them, you need to go check your servers. You need to go to your environment. Stop ignoring me. And they, he, she, or the group was sending emails and text messages to the owners of the company. So they, they did enough reconnaissance to know how to contact these people. They come in and they ended up starting to call all their engineers. From what I can understand from some of the posts is that they didn't have a dedicated IT person. It was an engineer. So presumably it was someone that was working on audio engineering and they were also the IT person, which I frequently see when I go into a lot of post-production houses that are smaller. They can't afford that. They might outsource it, but a lot of times it's the most technical person that's in the shop. That's the IT person. And so those people came in, left their families on Christmas morning to find out that um, the facility, the Larson studio that works on big films, I mean, Netflix, ABC, NBC, FX, all that stuff, um, was in fact stolen and not only stolen, but they ended up deleting all the contents on the Larson's um, servers. So they grabbed it, they took it for ransom and they deleted everything as well. And basically said, if you don't, if you want to keep this quiet and you don't want us to post this on Pirate Bay or other places and leak this, then we are, you, know, you need to pay us 80,000 or $50,000. Otherwise we're going to go ahead and post this. Your reputation will be ruined. Netflix is going to be mad at you, et cetera. Um, They've only posted on Pirate Bay after this whole thing, I'm getting ahead of myself, but 10 of the 13 episodes. They stole 13, but only posted 10. We're not really sure where, why they didn't post those other 13. Um, so they demanded $50,000 immediately. The Larsons kept trying to delay it and talk to the FBI and figure out what they were going to do. They were, um, you know, there's reports that they were just shaking on Christmas Day, like, what do we do? You know, we thought we had security. We thought we were good. Um, they ended up paying the ransom. So they ended up paying the $50,000, but the data still got leaked after that point. And that's a little bit unheard of uh, for the most part with ransoms, because if you think about it, if criminals keep their promise and they get the money from you, then they're going to keep doing it. But if they take your money, they leak the content, then you're going to stop paying them because you know that they're going to leak it anyways. Um, but what happened is the Larsons were required to sign a legal contract with the attacker. It was this long contract. They signed this whole thing and it said all these clauses that they wrote in there, like you can't talk to the FBI, you can't do this, you can't do that. And then long story short, the attackers alleged that the Larsons talked to the FBI and that's why they were going to then post things on Pirate Bay because they went back on their contract. Um, probably one of the first times I've seen a hacker or hacker groups have a contract. They're starting to get really good at business here. Um, the reports show that the Larson Studio had public facing Windows 10 systems, but it says they were legacy systems and goes on to say they're Windows 7. At the time of this attack, it wasn't legacy. As we know, Windows 7 still has a couple months left of before its end of life. So I kind of think it was a mistake or a typo and it was actually XP or Server 2003 boxes, but the reports say it was legacy to, uh, Windows 7 systems that were public facing. If you looked at their website, it's running Microsoft front page as well. So we can see that their overall security posture was not good. I believe that site is still up to today. Um, the Larsons um, had a hard time even paying the ransom. So any of you have been involved with paying any uh, ransomware or anything like that, you've, if you haven't dealt with Bitcoin before, it's more accessible now, but back in the day, I remember I went on a, um, 
I don't even know how to describe it, but it was a Bitcoin exchange meetup from Craigslist. Um, Cause at the time, no one really, we didn't know how to exchange and get Bitcoin and we couldn't do it fast enough to pay the ransom. So I went with a CIO and we're both in, in our suits and we go to Craigslist to try and find someone since we couldn't go to Bank of America, they wouldn't give us Bitcoin. And we, the guy wanted to meet in a public place. He said only in a Starbucks parking lot. He came in with a hoodie on. We gave him cash, you know, $600 and he gave us Bitcoin and we went on our way. But nowadays it's a little easier. You've got Coinbase and some of these other exchanges that you can, you can make it a little easier. But Larson's bank ended up blocking the payment. They said, why are you moving $50,000 to Coinbase for a business? This is unusual. They blocked it. They had to deal with the bank and tell them the bank's like, you need to talk to the FBI first. They said, we did. It kept going back and forth. Ended up finally taking 19 transactions to pay the ransom. And then on March 31st, 2017, the FBI said the hackers were now going to the studios with the same content like Netflix and saying, we got this because it wasn't just the orange is the new black. They got other content as well going to the studios and trying to blackmail them. And that's why the attackers didn't want them to talk to anyone because if they kept quiet and no one talked to each other, now the studios thought that they got it from them. So they were trying to double dip with the content they stole. Um, hackers ended up um, also tipping off journalists. So they would go to like Wired or Vanity or whoever, and they'd say, hey, you might want to talk to Larson Studio. We think there's a breach. And they would see if they would talk about it and basically to test them to see if they would still, if they would talk or not. And the attackers ended up sending another message to Larson saying, good, this was a test and you passed. Um, this was the message eventually that the Dark Overlord sent to the Larsons. They said, we're a professional outfit. Unfortunately, in any line of business, sometimes clients can become disruptive. They called them clients. Um, to their own good. In this case, Larson Studios blatantly violated the terms of our agreement by extensively cooperating with law enforcement. Our reaction was the direct result of the disregard of Larson Studios had on our contract. And they ended up leaking 10 of the 13 episodes on Pirate Bay. So what's up with Larson Studios today? Well, they lost multiple clients because of this. I was surprised that a lot of studios still worked with them and tried to help them through the breach. If I was a studio, I'd be like, you're done, you know, you had your opportunity, but I guess they were more forgiving. Some of them were not. Um, some of those episodes got leaked. It's, it's all over the news. If you look at Larson Studios, you can't even find their website. You find all the, the talks about breaches. And uh, they claim that they've spent over $100,000 in upgrading their systems after the fact. That wasn't included, that wasn't part of the ransom, that wasn't part of the, um, the investigation. That's after the fact to then try and build up their defense after, after the whole incident. Um, I've tried to confirm whether they're in business or not. Yelp says they're closed. I've called their number and it doesn't really do anything. Their website shows that they have a TPN certification, which has been around just the last year or two. So I feel like they, if they went out of business, it was in the last um, probably six months or so, but I can't get a hold of anyone there um, either. So it might've put them out of business at this point. Um, the Disney hack. So this one was interesting because there was all kinds of claims from uh, attackers on Twitter and media outlets that they'd been breached. Disney was being very quiet in the beginning. They weren't saying much about it. And then eventually they came out and they said, no, we didn't actually get hacked. Uh, this isn't true. Um, but there was internal memos that might have um, made people feel otherwise. Um, the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise is a, a $3.72 billion uh, franchise. And from this date, we don't see any leaks of it, but they might have paid the ransom and denied it. We just don't know. The attackers keep saying that they were able to get the ransom. Disney says, no, we never paid that. We wouldn't cooperate with terrorists. Um, line 204, this one really wasn't part of on my radar in the beginning, but I added it in because the CEO was very upfront about this. They said, I can confirm that Line 204 was a victim of an international cyber attack organization on this date. And the other piece that's interesting is that it was the Dark Overlord again, right? So this group or this person seems to be targeting these vendors within the media and entertainment industry. Um, the CEO has come up front and been very transparent with some of their stuff. Um, says that it cost them over $600,000 in security upgrades after the fact. Um, the Dark Overlord has posted a lot on Twitter, claiming responsibility, giving more details. Um, the Dark Overlord as well keeps doing interviews with databreaches.net. They reach out and talk on encrypted channels. 
seems to be, they, him, her, seem to be very transparent with what they're doing. Um, you have to make the assumption they're being honest, but they're giving a lot of details. They would even send data breach, uh, breaches.net some sample files. So if data breaches.net reaches out, says, hey, we heard that you have attacked line uh, 204. Um, can you give us some more information? Dark Overlord will then send an encrypted file with sample data, like credit card numbers that are truncated, social security numbers, celebrities home addresses to prove that the, the breach is real. Um, so it seems like what they're saying is accurate for, for as far as we can verify. Um, the other interesting thing is that the attacker or attackers were on the Line 204's network for over a year, sitting there slow, slowly exfiltrating data to gain a terabyte of data, and they eventually grabbed that and they have it. Uh, they posted some of that online as well. Um, some of that sample loot was sent over to the databreaches.net. They were able to verify bank deposit information, customer credit card numbers, client information such as like uh, famous singers and celebrities' home addresses, social security numbers, etc. So. We can see that there's an increase in attacks, right? The, the Verizon DBIR report shows that it's the, the second biggest industry for breaches. We can see a bunch of these big notable incidents. Um, one thing I really wish people did more of was discuss a little bit more of what happened, how it happened so we could all learn from it. We're really left with a bunch of news data that may or may not be accurate. We can't verify where they got that information. So this is these are the big ones that I was able to find and uncover and from um, working in the industry, get the most information on. And so we've seen all these things happen and the industry has taken a lot of different changes as far as content security. And the most recent one, 2018, was the Trusted Partner Network, the TPN. And prior to the TPN, what would happen is if I was the Larson Studio and I was working with Netflix, Disney, Marvel, Lucasfilms, ABC, NBC, all these different studios, and I wanted to work with them. It all depended on the studio. It was either before or before they send me content or during the content transfer process or somewhere along that way, they would come out and verify that my security standards are up to par, like a vendor review. And in that process, every studio had their own way of doing things. There was some, some baselines and the MPAA in the past had done assessments. Price Waterhouse did some in the past. Deloitte, I believe, did some in the past. So they constantly had been shifting around with how they do these assessments. And finally, um, they, they realized we need to come up with a standard, right? We've got PCI for credit card data. We have HIPAA. We've got all these other standards. We need something in the media entertainment industry. And personally, being on some of these audits, so I, I do both sides of it being a trusted uh, partner network qualified assessor. I'm one of about 30 people worldwide that can go on behalf of the studios and check compliance. But then I also, more often than that, I will represent our clients when Amazon Studios or Netflix or Hulu or whoever wants to come out and do that assessment. I'll act almost like a, an attorney for them and represent them because I know what they're going to look for. I know how to answer the questions so they don't get into trouble. Um, we go through that process. And from being on those, the way that the different studios assess a vendor is completely different. Um, for example, there is a, I won't name them, but there is a hardware manufacturer that's getting into the streaming business. And when they come out, they all they really care about is physical security. I mean, they want rooms locked down. They want key card access. They've asked our clients why uh, executives in the company have access to an editing room. And their answer is because I am responsible for the organization and that's not good enough. And they basically say, until you pull your CEO or your COO, or your CFO's access to this editing bay, we're not going to give you any content. Um, they want security guards 24 seven on site. So some of these, these studios are very focused on one thing and it's a little surprise when you go through it and you realize, wait a second, I thought we were more worried about digital content or their workflow or whatever it is. And once you go through some of these assessments, um, you start to realize where studios are focusing, what is more important to them, but it's, it's different every time. You could have one assessor from the one studio come out, they give you a pass or they, they give you some remediation items. The next year, you don't change anything and all of a sudden you have all these different remediation items. So it was chaotic. There are countless stories I have of uh, vendors we've represented when a studio has come out for the assessment and they panic. 
weeks before they're approving tens of thousands of dollars of labor and products and they're like we need to get our sim working we need to get this we need to get that they go into panic and every other project gets dropped until they can focus on some things they think the studio is worried about I've, it's gone as far as um, I was cracking up they didn't find it so funny but there was a door that was locked to a server room and the IT manager didn't realize that they had put a lock on that door that morning before the auditor got there and he goes to try and get into the door and hits his head on the door and then tries to play it off and says, I must have forgot my key somewhere. And they're trying to figure out who had the key to the server room. And it's pretty obvious to everyone that they just added this door or the lock to it. But there's these, these panic things. I've been in another assessment where um, there was such panic that they had told the, the auditors they were doing things by the book or the way they wanted. The auditor asked, well, can you verify this? And when they went ahead and tried to verify it, um, the person, the IT person stepped out and basically pulled the internet for the company because they didn't air gap things like they, they said. They're like, can we look at Pirate Bay or can we go to Google on this editor bay? And they said, sure. The other guy ran, pulled the internet cable so that the internet wouldn't work on that. Obviously, it didn't work on the entire company. So then everyone started coming to the IT room and knocking and they were shooing people away because the auditor was there. It's just absolutely chaotic. So because this is their livelihood and they could not get a deal because they're not in compliance or they don't have the security standards, they're trying everything they can to do the bare minimum to pass these assessments. So the TPN, there's a joint alliance between the MPAA and CDSA. It's a way to do third party security assessments on vendors that the studios are gonna use. Um, they, the goal of it is to try and help prevent leaks, breaches, and a bunch of the things we just talked about. Um, it raises security awareness and preparedness for the industry. And then it's broken down to three sections. This is actually a pretty decent framework. Um, you can Google the MPAA content security best practices. It's about an 80, 90 page uh, PDF. And it's public. So all these vendors can go look at it. They know what they're going to be judged against. And they break it down to three different categories. They use like NIST, ISO, some SANS material to try and come up with the best practices. And they break it down to management systems, which is like a lot of policy, procedure, background checks, vetting, that kind of thing. Um, physical security, so like security cameras, door locks, um, isolation of rooms, and then digital security, which has a lot to do with you know, antivirus, EDR tools, having SIM set up, proper workflow and whatnot. So we talked already a little bit about before the TPN, but just to reiterate, if you're working with, let's say 25 studios, every 12 to 18 months, that studio is gonna come out and do a day of audits on you and go through all these things. So could you imagine that? Let's say it's on the 12 month scale. You're, it's more than one a month that you're going through more than two a month that you're going through these audits, panicking, trying to get everything in line. They come out, they give you their list of remediation items. You then have to fix all these things. It's just, it's utter chaos. So that's how things went beforehand. You didn't know what was coming up. Now that the TPN's in place, long as the studio accepts the TPN, it's a reduced number of assessments. You, you have one per year, it's good for 12 months. And you've got, you don't have to worry about different controls. This, this person's or this assessor's worried about physical security. This one's worried about digital security. This one worries about policies. It's just a standard across the board. Um, you've got a competitive market-driven assessment pricing. This is probably the biggest kickback because, or the, the pushback from vendors. Prior to the TPN, the studios come out on their own dime and they'll assess you with employees that they have or contractors. Now with the TPN, the vendors most of the time pay that fee once a year for the assessment and then it's good for the next 12 months. So a lot of vendors, especially these little you know, three-man shops or seven-person shop, they're having the biggest problem with it because they say, we didn't have to have this expense and now you're, you're making us pay this. And this assessment, while it's public knowledge, it's actually a lot more difficult than when Disney or Marvel came out because you're really checking everything off. Because if you can imagine, Disney can take that risk by only checking five things that you told them. But if it's an independent assessor like myself, I have to go out and make sure if you say you have a background check, you need to prove it to me. So I'm doing a lot more due diligence. And rather than a two to four hour studio assessment, these TPN assessments are taking about six to eight hours. Um, and then once you come up with your vulnerabilities or remediation items, so we found out you're not doing a SIM or you're not doing proper logging or whatever the remediation item is, then the TPN will track that and all the studios that are members of the TPN can see that and they could say, okay, well, you know, they didn't pass the TPN. There's not really a pass fail, but you've got a bunch of remediation items, but it's really policy stuff. When you actually look at it, they're doing logging, they're doing antivirus, they're doing file or full disk encryption. They're doing all these things. They just didn't have the policy. 
So we'll accept that risk, and they have an idea of what they, they want to accept, but it's all out in the open where they can see that. Um, one big thing that a lot of people don't uh, realize going through this process is that anything the assessor puts on that report is, I wouldn't call it public, but it's accessible by all studios. So if you told Disney, yes, I have an air-gapped network, and the TPN assessor comes out and finds you don't, that's public to Disney. They can look at that and be like, well, you lied to us then, or that's not accurate. So um, a lot of companies are doing, they're trying to get ready for this. They're not quite ready. It's a lot of stuff to look at. If we look at this, it's, it's kind of small here, but this is how the TPN is broken down with the management systems, physical security, digital security. And you can see there's all kinds of stuff in there as far as um, like on the physical side, locks, cameras, you know, who a physical security guard, who has access to the building, sign-in process, et cetera. And probably the most interesting piece, um, and if anyone's more interested in going in detail, we can talk about this um, afterwards, but this is essentially the workflow that the MPAA and the TPN are requiring of studios. So for a small company with three employees, having something like this is very difficult for them. It's essentially isolating in the, the top left corner there, any content that's coming in. So if I'm gonna work on the next Marvel film, I have to first have a, almost an air-gapped network, but I can only allow, so it's a deny all, and then I allow access to Marvel Studios, uh, FT, I'm not gonna say FTP server, but sometimes it's still out there. <laughs> um, but they're a Spara server, they're Signet server, whatever's for transferring. That's the only website I can go to on one of those IO, uh, IO systems, which is in the pink on the left there. So I've got internet access, but it's only to these specific websites, these studios that I work with. Once it goes onto that IO system, it then gets sucked into the yellow part, the content network there. And that content network is the one that's supposed to be completely air-gapped. You, know, you can have access to, let's say, a domain controller or your logging system, but that's it. In that environment, no internet access, you can't surf the web, you can't check emails, it's, it's isolated there. The other interesting part is that because you have that access from the IO network to the content network, um, it's a one-way flow, which is probably the hardest piece of this for most people to do as far as digital security. When you're on that I.O. station after you downloaded the Marvel content, you cannot then go put it on the file server on the content side. You actually have to suck it in from the content side because that's the more secure environment. Um, the other way you can do it is sneaker netting it, but if you're doing that and using an encrypted USB drive, you have to have a dedicated room with cameras, door prop alarms, and you bring it in there. Uh, the, the computer in that room has to be monitored with restricted access. You have to have tamper-resistant stickers on things. I mean, it's, it's absolutely kind of like a, going into a secure facility in the government if you've ever done that. Um, and you can work on the content, but when it's done, you have to then push it back to the IO station and then push it back up. So it's like many hops. And the biggest pushback we've seen from a lot of people is like, hey, I've got you know, people, I don't wanna buy three computers for every person because my IO computer can't have full internet access. My content computer is like the editor machine that's working on this editing bay. It can't have internet access. I still need to check email and get images and stuff. So now I need an internet computer. So do I really have to buy three computers for all my employees? If you wanna follow this, kind of, you can have some dedicated data wranglers that are pulling things in and out, but the way that they want it set up is really to protect the content. Anytime it's being worked on, um, anyone's working on it, it is highly restricted and there's a very low chance of a leak. And if you kind of walk through some of this and happy to do it later with anyone, the flow is kind of interesting because any different point can kind of break down on this flow and you're still secure. So I had um, one studio say, well, if I bring something in and maybe it was a malicious um, file from a studio, it's still gonna get into my network because it's sucked in. And I said, yes, but when it gets sucked into your content network, what does malware normally do? Phone home, encrypt things, it's gotta have some type of command and control, there's gotta be something else going on, otherwise it's essentially sandboxed in that, that secure environment. So tons of these little pieces can kind of break down and you still have so many layers of security that it really keeps the, the data secure. But the challenge is for a lot of smaller shops is to really implement something like this. But when it's done well, it is a, an extremely secure workflow that you can move things and high amounts of data in and out of your environment with limited impact to your operations. Um, I'm gonna stop it there and I'll give about five minutes for questions before we end. I appreciate you all uh, coming. I ran out of business cards. So if you wanna connect later on LinkedIn or Twitter or anything, I'll leave my contact information up there and we can uh, chat there. But 
Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. Any questions? Yeah, question. Sure, good question. So the question is, um, tools moving to cloud or SaaS or internet-based um, applications like Adobe, um, are we seeing a shift to that? And, and how to kind of how do we deal with that, right? So loaded question. The most studios do not allow any type of content on the internet. So AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, the MPAA and the TPN are working on a cloud and AppSec framework. They're having a lot of difficulty with uh, agreeing on the best practices for that. Um, Amazon is sponsoring most of the content security conferences, but they are not really there at this point. I think they're kind of waiting for the approval before they invest in it. Um, Microsoft and the Azure people are investing heavily in workflows. And they have built out a lot of templates, models, and ways to do that. They also have support from Avid, which is a big product. And I think Adobe is in there as well. But as far as I want to use Google uh, or G Suites or OneDrive to store content, it's an absolute no. I ran into that even this week um, with some of the studios I work with. The, everyone wants to get there. It's going to take a lot for the industry to agree on a standard because of the things that keep coming out, like Capital One. And they're worried about that. They really are having one bucket that's insecure, and then they lose millions or billions of dollars. Everyone wants it, though. The other challenge is that a lot of people that, are, that work IT and security in this industry, media entertainment specifically, have been there for a long time, and they're stuck in those old ways. So if I can't have internet, I don't really need to know about routing and switching and you know protocols, ports. It's all. It's just there. I have come into post-production houses where they said we can't have USB, so we put super glue in the USB ports. That's the kind of thing I, I run into. I have talked about you've got these huge subnets. Let's supernet this and, and shrink this down a bit, and their their eyes just gloss over and they're like, what? You know, why would we? We the second octet is what we adjust for every VLAN that we have. You don't need that. You've got two servers in here. Let's bring this down a little bit. And just, I, I can't deal with, no, you know, I don't want that. The moment that we have anything that conflicts with Avid, Adobe, Pro Tools, whatever it is, like Endpoint Protector is a product that we use to lock down the endpoints, um, they disable it. They're like, we can't, IT says, we can't deal with this. We're going to disable this. So it, you've got a lot of, I don't want to say ar archaic IT and security people, but people that have been stuck in, we can't have Wi-Fi, we can't have the internet, we can't have these things. So it's, it's not a lot of modern technology. And having someone that's worked in the same place for 10 or 15 years with, with no internet access on a lot of systems supporting that, it's, um, it's a challenge to get them up to speed with cloud and AppSec. The other piece is the, the studios really coming to a consensus. You've got the TPN, I think, has about 25 member studios. They all have to agree on the best practice. And so it was supposed to be last year that they released the framework for App and Cloud. It's not there yet. I've seen the updated one. They say the end of this year coming up. I think it's going to be next year. They keep pushing it. Disney has claimed that they have some white papers on best practices. Um, but I've even asked. Um, uh, Amazon Studios in certain scenarios, what are you allowing on the cloud? And it was still very limited in how it's configured and stuff like that. So um, still not of a lot of adoption. And everyone scared a vendor doesn't want to go use the cloud when they don't have approval or blessing from all the other studios or the MPAA. So <clears throat> it's coming. It's just going to take a lot of work and pushing. And then once we get approval, we have a severe lack in security people in that industry that know how to deal with big data, bandwidth, artistic people, and the workflows that they have. It's, it's brand new. It took me a long time to get this workflow down and how they want things air-gapped, unless you've worked in like military environments before. So yeah, that's a long-winded answer. But <laughs> any other questions yeah, in the back? Yeah, so the question was, the TPN have anything around social engineering? They do require that um, employees are trained uh, regularly, and that includes um, social media, social engineering, that kind of stuff. 
The TPN actually has their own training platform too, so you can get it from them, or you can go with like Know Before, FishMe, or some other place. Um, and then they, so that you've got to train all your employees. Your executives have to have somewhat of special training. If you have over, I think, 25 employees, you also have to have an executive committee. It's third party about risk and stuff like that, um, that adheres to that. And then you also have all the physical security controls in place to try and mitigate social engineering. So you, you have to document and monitor, control all your ingress and egress points in the building, electronic key cards with um, 12 months of logging. You have to have um, CCTV in multiple different locations, but they can't face production screens because now you're recording content. <laughs> um, they used to make it black and white. They didn't want you doing color on the next Marvel film. Um, and then you've got um, you know, vendor review, you've got limited access to certain locations, least privilege. So they do a bunch of things in place to mitigate against social engineering. They don't require any phishing campaigns. We do that for our clients because we feel like that validates the, um, the training. And then also you have to have policies in place that educate them on some of that stuff, you know, tailgating and, and whatnot, piracy and that kind of thing. Good question. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Have you seen any success with watermark and acknowledging when um, the response is very, very low? Yeah. So the question is, is there any success with watermarking for, for dealing with content? Yes, if you can. And so a lot of studios will put the watermarking on, um, on the content if you're doing certain pieces of it. But for example, if you're doing uh, quality control, you need to have the raw full featured content there pre-release to look at it because you're looking for boom arms that might pop into the frame or something that's under a couch that you didn't see. So they need to see that whole piece. Um, other people, and there are some good technologies where you can like overlay it and pull it off and stuff. And when possible, it's always good to have the burn in of the watermark where they can't remove it. But I find more often than not, they say they can't do that or the systems they're working on doesn't support it. Um, and in a lot of those cases, it's, it's clean footage. Any other questions? Great. Well, th uh, one more. <laughs> track and disable content if it's stolen uh, yeah I've seen I've seen some people talk about it I haven't I haven't played with it too much um, and there there were some things as far as like uh, using certain frequencies and audio and pieces like that where you can track it I've talked to some audio mixers and they've said we can't have that you know even though you can't hear to the the human ear they say no that spoils I can't I see it on the screen we can't have that at all um, I have seen some companies that with products, I just can't speak to which ones work well and which ones don't that will um, be able to corrupt it or modify it or basically spoil it if it does get leaked and that kind of thing. Yeah, I think we're out of time, but I'll be around in the hall if anyone else has any questions. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> <laughs>